Mr. President, thank you for doing this. Let's start with the debate. Uh, you and your team said have said you had a bad night, but your but your friend Nancy Pelosi actually framed the question that I think is on the minds of millions of Americans: Was this a bad episode or the sign of a more serious condition? It's a bad episode. No indicated any serious condition. I was exhausted. I did less than my instincts in terms of preparing and, and bad nights. You know, you say you were exhausted, and, and I know you've said that before as well, but you came and you did have a tough month, and you came home from Europe about 11 or 12 days before the debate, spent six days in Camp David. Why wasn't that enough rest time, enough recovery time? Because I was sick. I was feeling terrible. Matter of fact, the docs with me, I asked if they did a COVID test, and you kind of figured out what's wrong. They did a test to see whether or not I had uh, some infection, you know, a virus. I didn't. I just had a really bad cold. Don't risk losing the photos and videos from your phone. This innovative device makes it easy to back up your smartphone. And did you ever watch the debate afterwards? I don't think I did, no. Well, what, I'm trying, what I want to get at is it, what were you experiencing as you were going through the debate? Did you know how badly it was going? Yeah, look. The whole way I prepared, nobody's fault of mine. Nobody's fault of mine. I uh, I prepared what I usually would do, sit down, as I did come back to the foreign leaders or the National Security Council for explicit detail. And I realized about partway through that, you know, all the, I did get quoted, the New York Times had me down at 10 points before the debate, nine now or whatever the hell it is. The fact of the matter is that what I looked at is that he also lied 28 times. I couldn't, I mean, the way the debate ran, not my fault, no one else's fault, no one else's fault. But it seemed like you were having trouble from the first question in, even before he spoke. Well, I just had a bad night. Mm -hmm. That's a bad night. Most of all, I, I can't remember any. I'm sure you did. I've got plenty. I, I, I guess the question of the problem is here for a lot of Americans watching is you've said, Going back to 2020, watch me you know, to people who are concerned about your age. And, you know, 50 million Americans watched that debate. It seemed to confirm fears they already had. Well, look, after that debate, I did 10 major events in a row, including until 2 o'clock in the morning after that debate. I did events in North Carolina, I did events in, in, in Georgia, I did events like this today, large crowds. Overwhelming response, no, no, no slippy. And so I just had a bad night. I don't know why. And, and how, how quickly did it did it come to you that you were having that bad night? Well, Kane was having a bad night when I realized that even when I was answering the question, even when I turned his mic off, he was still shouting. And I, I let him distract me. I, I'm not blaming on that. But I realized that I just wasn't in control. But part of the other concern is that uh, this seems to have fit into a pattern of decline that has been reported on recently. New York Times had a headline on July 2nd, Biden's lapses are said to be increasingly common and worrisome. Here's what they wrote. People who have spent time with President Biden over the last few months or so said the lapses appear to have grown more frequent, more pronounced, and after Thursday de Thursday's debate, more worrisome. By many accounts, as evidenced by video footage, observation, and interviews, Mr. Biden is not the same today as he was even when he took office three and a half years ago. Similar reporting in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Are you the same man today that you were when you took office three and a half years ago? In terms of success is yes. I also was the guy together a peace plan for the Middle East that made the coming fruition. I was also the guy that expanded NATO. I was also the guy that grew the economy. All the individual things that were done were ideas I had or I felt I moved on. And so, for example, you know, well, well that was true then. What's Biden done lately? She just today just announced 200,000 new jobs. We're moving in a direction that no one's ever taken on. I know you know this from the days in the, in the, in the government. Took on big pharma. I beat them. No one said I could beat them. We took on all the things we said we got done. We're told we couldn't get done. Part of it is 
what I said when I ran was I wanted to do three things. Restore some decency to the office. Restore some support for the middle class instead of trickle-down economics both from the middle out and the bottom up, the way the wealthy still do find everyone who's better, and unite the country. But what has it? This is the president of the United States, Joseph Biden. Now, it's obvious that Joseph Biden is evidently suffering from rapid mental um, decline. It's very sad to watch him as he articulates his sentiments. But one also has to accept responsibility. And it seems to me that he's blaming everything on Donald Trump, that he is a pathological liar and that he was shouting even after his mic had been turned off. So whilst he's saying that he's accepting responsibility for his physical exhaustion, having traveled to Europe, and that he also suffered from some cold, right? He was, you know, uh, experiencing symptoms of the cold. I am not sure if he's trying to suggest it was the cold that caused him to have performed badly, or it's Donald Trump's, you know, lying and also his shouting shouts. Um that contributed to his uh, disastrous performance at the presidential debate, which was held recently. Now, it's very sad. And today I would like to look briefly at the at Joe Biden, as it were, the defiant Catholic president, right? Because he is Catholic. And we shall be looking at some very important articles that were written about Mr. Biden. Now, remember now that the United States was founded as a Protestant nation. The pilgrims who went there were fleeing from Europe, particularly um, England. Well, uh, England did not have the Catholic Church per se. They had the Church of England, the Anglican Church, which is not much different from a Catholic, from the Roman Catholic Church. Remember now it was George, King George VIII, was the eighth, right, who separated from the Church of Rome because he wanted to, he wanted divorce and the Catholic Church would not have allowed that to have taken place. And therefore he renounced his Catholicism and he went and he started a new church. But the church evidently was not new. They practiced the same form of persecutions and literally has the same liturgy. And the belief system is practically the same. Right, but King Henry, because he was his King George was actually King Henry the Eighth, right? Not George, right? My pardon, it was King Henry the Eighth who actually separated from the Anglican, from the Catholic Church, um, that was the dominant church in England at the time. Now, the pilgrims who fled to the United States, they were looking for freedom, right? They were looking for a church without a pope and a nation without a king, right? And we often talk about the two-horned beast that was mentioned in Revelation, this nation that came out of the earth, right? Uh, not a very densely populated area um, and sought to, you know, diffuse freedom in that nation along around the world. But we must remember that the United States started also as a beast, right? The, the horns were lamb-like, but the nation itself spoke like a beast, spoke like a dragon. Remember that it is a mirror image of the Roman Empire, right? Of the former empire, which was before it, which eventually was essentially was the Roman Catholic legacy. So the United States is going to eventually form that sort of image, but it came out of the earth as a beast with two lamb-like horns. And it took me many years to learn that, that the horns are what the... The um, John the Revelator, that's what he describes as lamb like, right? Symbol of Christ, that it came up innocently. So it, it, it exemplified religious and civil liberties. That's essential, the core doctrine, the core belief system of the United States of America. Now, when the United States was founded, many of its citizens had anti-Catholic sentiments, right? They did not want Catholics within their country. It, it, it's, it's interesting to note, I'm not sure if they were so much anti the Church of England as much as they were anti-Roman Catholic. But for many years, the United States um, pilgrims did not want their rival. They 
discouraged the arrival of Roman Catholics to the 13 colonies. But you know, as time went by, um, eventually Catholics came over and many of them came over in disguise, right? They came over as Protestants, but evidently they were masquerade. They were they masked, as it were, their Catholic identity, but they beneath that garment, they were really Catholics, but they pretended to have been Protestant. It's interesting to note that the American history of protest Protestantism has been lost and many Americans do not even understand what it means to be a Protestant. If you ask the typical American, they don't know. It, it's coming from the word protest, right? That is the word from which um, uh, Protestant came about. Now, the question is, what were they protesting against? And they were obviously protesting against the Church of Rome, right? And also the Church of England. Now, let's look at Joseph Biden. And who is Joseph Biden? We shall be looking at some interesting articles here that I pulled up. Can't read everything, can't divulge everything to you. But let's be clear on this. Joseph Biden is clear that he is not going to go away, right? He's absolutely not leaving the presidency. He will not retire. That's what he's saying. We don't know. Only God knows the future. And we don't know if they will eventually force him out of the office. But personally, he is adamant that he is not going to leave. He's not going to retire from office, even though he's not really mentally nor physically fit for the position which he holds. But he is very, very um, confident that he can, you know, carry out the job and the exigences of the role that he's occupying. Now, let's look at this, you know, I put up this article from the Irish Times and let me share my screen with you and let you see what is happening. And who is really Joseph Biden? Says here that Joe Biden says his Catholicism a private matter, but it is a big part of his political ideology. And he had visits to Santa Rafa Lady of Knock and speech at St. Murdoch's Cathedral in Bellino show importance of faith to U.S. president, right? So he, so it has already been visited by two popes, two saints, and soon a U.S. president. The White House confirmed late on Monday that President Joseph Biden would visit the Santa Rafa Lady of Knock, better known as the Knock Shrine, during his trip to or Mayo or Mayo later this week. So we have that he's going to visit that site. Now, Biden has been described as the most overtly religious US president in more than 40 years. Let me repeat that. Biden has been described as the most overtly religious US president in more than 40 years since Jimmy Carter. So, so much about the separation of church and state. Biden attends weekly mass and keeps a picture of Pope Francis in the Oval Office. Yet, for him, faith is a private matter. As it is for many Irish Catholics, among the 66.4% who voted to repeal the Eighth Amendment in 2018, while he does not agree with abortion personally, he is pro-choice. But remember now that the Roman Catholic Church cannot be put into one box, as in many. Also, I could say the same thing for many Protestant and Protestant churches, because you have liberal Catholics and you also have conservative Catholics, but they are essentially Catholics, right? And the Pope can play both sides, the priests, right, and the, you know, the members of the laity, they actually can play both sides. They're both also conservatives as well as they are liberals. So sometimes people say, oh, the Catholics don't believe in abortion. Oh, well, yeah, the, the conservative Catholics don't, but the liberals do, right? It is. So this is not enough for the more ideological Catholics in the U.S. or that country's bishops of whom the more conservative believe the president should be refused communion for his pro-choice views. It is not a view shared by Pope Francis, is who in September 2021 said, I have never refused the Eucharist to anyone it means that he will give the Eucharist to people who also are pro-choice, right? That is the impression. So let's look at 
in the U.S., Catholics are the largest Christian denomination and make up over a fifth of the population. At about 72 million people, or an estimated 22%, Latinos make up 40% of those and are predominantly Democrat. White Catholics make up the rest and are believed to be evenly divided between Republicans and Democratic supporters. While it has been claimed that it was white Catholic pro-life women who secured the White House for Donald Trump. So we see here where Catholics are divided into two groups. You have the Latinos, which we call Hispanics, who largely come from Latin America and perhaps also from other countries, but largely from Latin America. And they're predominantly Democrats, right? even though they're Catholics, but they are pro the Democratic Party, while you have the predominantly white population, as the author here suggests, belong to the Republican base. There was a shift during the Donald Trump's victory in 2016, um, in which some of the white, who were then white liberals, became conservative for various reasons. And I think it could largely have, you know, been attributed to the fact that Hillary Clinton was running and many Americans were, you know, anti the Clintons because they found them to have been despicable um, individuals, not only her husband, but um, Hillary herself. In general, however, the U.S. that, in general, however, the U.S., that most Protestant country, has moved quite a distance where Catholicism is concerned. Democrat Albert Smith, the first Catholic to win nom nomination for the presidency, lost the 1928 presidential election because of fears he would take direction from the Pope. So back then, Americans knew that the Roman Catholic Church is a religio-political organization. It means, therefore, that it believes in the union of church and state. America stands diametrically opposed to that sort of philosophy, at least what is claimed, what is asserted in its constitution and the Bill of Rights. Now, this subject was famously addressed, directed by John F. Kennedy in September 1960, when he told the Greater Houston Ministerial Association during the presidential campaign, and I quote, this is, these words are directly from former, Prime, former President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party's candidate for president who also happens to be a Catholic. I do not speak for my church on public matters, and the church does not speak for me, and unquote. Well, is that so? Because we understand that the all Catholics, irrespective of where you live, whether in the United States or outside, once you are Catholic and you're leaders, particularly when you're a leader, your first allegiance is to the Pope of Rome. First allegiance is to the Pope of Rome. So, you know, he can say all he wants to say but we understand that essentially, unless you're going to be a rebel, and perhaps John F. Kennedy had become a rebel. Don't know. We were not there, so we can't impugn motive to the man. Despite this, he still took a hammering in the more Protestant states. They favored Richard Nixon, who hailed from an Irish Quaker background in Po Laoi. Now, that's interesting that, you know, when we look back to the 1960s, America was far much a different country than it is now. The people then understood the role of the Catholic Church. The question is, has the Catholic Church changed? They have not changed, right? The Roman Catholic Church has not changed. It still believes in the union of church and state. And you only have to visit Latin, Latin American countries or countries that are predominantly Catholic and you will see that the leaders in these countries have to submit to the wishes and the desires of the Roman Catholic papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, because they run the show there, right? And they do not hide, they do not conceal their purposes, as we see in America where they work behind the scenes. But we're seeing now that they're not much working behind the scenes because you have the second Catholic you are the second president of the United States who happens to be Catholic and a devout one, not someone who just goes to church occasionally, but he is a devout 
Roman Catholic. President Biden is a devout Roman Catholic. That is something that we have to understand. And we have to look at the ethos of, you know, of President Biden and the Roman Catholic faith, as it were. Now, so he visited the, the shrine and um, that's what uh, he was about. Now, let's look at this here. Biden will be gifted a stone. Uh, um, no, I think I might have. So, um, the subject was famously addressed directly by John F. Kennedy in September 1960, when he told the greater Houston, I think I read this already. So we, we have read already that America is a different religious land um, and also political landscape than it was in the 1960s. Now, there is another article that I pulled up, and it's the title of the article is America's Second Catholic President Faces a Vastly Different Landscape Than the First. Right. And we can see here the analysis was done by Mark Wingfield and it's coming from the Baptist News Global. So this is from the Baptist Church. Let me see if I can make the font uh, bigger, larger, so that I will be able to see it much better. OK, so we have here the first time Americans elected a Catholic as president, Baptists were among those expressing alarm over possible violations of church-state separation. This year, with the imminent inauguration of President-elect Joe Biden as the nation's second Catholic president, the landscape looks vastly different. Virtually nowhere in the debate among the 2020 or during the 2020 election was concern raised by Baptists or anyone else about Biden being loyal to Pope over country. The primary charges leveled against John F. Kennedy in 1960. Instead, Baptists are now starkly divided in their views of what church-state separation is, actually means, and the Pope is not the threat he once seemed to be. It's interesting to note that in former times, Americans understood that the Pope, the Roman Catholic papacy, stood as the greatest existential threat to their democracy, to their freedom. Now we have it's the right wing um, party, political party that is the greatest threat to their freedom and democracy. Now, is the Pope working behind the scenes to distract Americans and the world's attention from its nefarious agenda? So they have, they create, they form as it were, they manufacture a different existential enemy. And people would never think, would never believe that the Roman Catholic papacy is the existential threat to the United States democracy and its freedom. Nobody, I, I mean, I think many people would not agree with that. They would think that the Roman Catholic Church, how could that be? Pope Francis is one of the nicest guys you can ever meet. But remember now we're talking about not the church itself, but we're talking about the system as it exists in the Vatican City there in Italy, right? So let us be clear on that, that we are not attacking Catholics because they're wonderful, some wonderful, and God has its people in all churches, including the Catholic Church. But we must understand that we have to unveil, we have to unpack the system of Catholicism that historically, and even now, it is not a pretty system. In fact, it's a hideous, a monstrous system, right, that killed Millions of people, over 50 million people were killed during the Dark Ages by that church. Over 50 million. And I think it was it was Rassinger who was correcting the number and said that that's an, a gross exaggeration, that it was that the figures were like 20 million. And I'm saying, okay, even if you killed 20 million Christians during that time, that's a lot of people. For a church to have killed during the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic papacy killed the they, 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 they hunted like wild animals, Protestants, who did not agree with their religious dogmas. Something that we have to remind ourselves of, and we've always got to keep within our consciousness. But I think most Americans and people in the world at large have forgotten that history. Now, let's continue with what he's saying here, with what the author is saying here, because he's giving some interesting perspectives. 
beginning with Ronald Reagan in 1980, but especially during the last four years of the Trump administration, more conservative and fundamentalist Baptists have emphasized their own ability to freely exercise religion rather than protecting religious expression for others. The brand of Christianity elevates the free exercise clause of the First Amendment over the Establishment Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. In 1960, it was potential violation of the Establishment Clause that gave Baptists concerns about Kennedy. The fear was that a Catholic president would be submissive to the Pope, thereby establishing Catholic theology, morality, and politics over all other religious expressions in America. That was the fear in the 1960s. No, we don't have any fear at all. The fear really are the Muslim terrorists along with American right, right wing um, followers, right? As it were, that those are the, that's the existential threat, and they are saying now that we can't have Donald Trump win the presidency because he represents fascism, right? And that fascism is going to America, and it's the right wing party that will bring that sort of government, that sort of authoritarian government to the United States. But if we should study the history of Roman Catholicism, we'll understand that they are the greatest authoritarians in the history of humanity, the Roman Catholic papacy, right? The greatest. Remember now, over 50 million people were killed during the period of the Dark Ages. We cannot forget what happened in Europe and the blood that flowed there by that church, that that church orchestrated unapologetically. Unapologetically. In, in fact, many times when the Christians were killed, they had parties in which they celebrated, right, for the deaths of the people whose voices they silenced because they did not agree with their religious beliefs and dogmas, something we must keep in mind. Now, let's continue with this very important article that was written by this author, this Baptist author, as it were. Now, this is not coming from a Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. It's coming from a Baptist who is aware of the history. He is aware of American history. And that is why I am not clamoring for church-state Union. I'm clamoring for religious education in schools, not for doctrines to be specific doctrines to be foisted upon students, but for students to be aware of the religious history of the United States, because much of it has been forgotten. We only study the perspective from a secular, um, you know, um, analysis, right? But we do not often we ignore to our peril the religious aspect, the religious founding of the United States as a Protestant nation, not as a Christian nation, but as a Protestant nation, right? Because when you say it's a Christian nation, people are going to say, what Christian? What denomination? Is it Anglican? Is it Seventh-day Adventist? Is it Baptist? Is it Methodist? But when you say it's a Protestant nation, you know the Protestants, you know, you had many religions and they believed in what freedom of religion and the freedom to express oneself according to the dictates of one's conscience. That is what the whole Protestant, you know, ideology um, promulgates. So that is what we have to understand. Now, so we're saying how the times has changed, right? The times have changed, I expect the pardon. Now, Brent Walker, former executive director of BJC, said today's political and religious landscape is indeed vastly different from 1960. And he quotes, I quote him here, nobody has said anything about Biden's Catholicism. It's a non-issue. People don't talk about it. It's what's the big deal? He explained, we've got seven sitting justices on the Supreme Court who are Catholic and nobody's sounding a peep over that, except we have Adventists, some Adventist pastors who have highlighted this fact that how can you have a Protestant nation and on the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. And remember now we see that a country speaks through its laws and you have seven Catholic lawyers 
right? That's interesting with no Protestants on that court. Whatever we've not done or fallen short on in educating the public about religious liberty and separation of church and state, we've done a good job of educating about the no religious test issue, we added. Now, how are Americans going to be educated about religious liberty? Because many Americans at the moment do not attend church. So how are they going to be educated about religious liberty if they're not taught in schools? Right? If the school system does not teach history and religious history, how are they going to be educated? That is the question I would like to ask. So in a sure sign of changing times, even evangelicals don't seem to be too concerned about Biden's Catholicism, Walker said. And they probably shouldn't be because they also don't seem to care about Trump's lack of religious commitment, right? So it's a totally different religious and political landscape that we are talking about, right? Totally different. Now, so... We hear of diplomatic relations with the Vatican. Remember now that the United States did not in part time have diplomatic. I think they had for some years and then they discontinued it. I think it was discontinued after the Civil War that the relation, the diplomatic relations between the Vatican and the United States were actually severed um, during, after the Civil War was fought. And, you know, the, the President Abraham Lincoln was speaking to a Jesuit, you know, who was a rebel Jesuit, I understand, um, and his name was Shinequi, right? I can't remember his first name. And he wrote 50 Years in the Church of Rome. That's a book you can access it online. 50 Years in the Church of Rome. I think he's Charles Shinequi, I think. And he was Canadian and he was a practicing Jesuit. And he understood the mission, the agenda of the Roman Catholic Church to actually destroy, as it were, to annihilate the United States, because when the United States was founded as a nation, the Roman Catholic Church found it to be despicable. It's on record if you can go and read it. Because the United States government is diametrically opposed to the philosophy and the religious dogma of the Roman Catholic papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. Something that you've got to understand. So Biden also will enter a global political scene, start with different from what greeted Kennedy in 1960. One of the primary differences is that the U.S. now has formal diplomatic relations with the Vatican. Vatican City, also known as Vatican City State. So the Vatican City, also known as Vatican City State. So it's both a church and a state. And that's what we say, that it believes in the union of church and state. The Roman Catholic papacy believes in the union of church and state. And if you read the book of Revelation, it's very clear that the woman is riding the beast. I think that is found in Revelation 17, right? The woman riding the beast. And woman is a symbol, a chaste woman is a symbol of Christ's church, right? And while you have a fallen church, the, the, the harlot in Revelation represents um, a fallen church. It talks about Babylon. Now, we talk, we, we, when we talk about Babylon and the Babylonian you know, system of worship, remember now that all major empires before, before the United States was founded, um, were actually, they believed in church-state union, the union of church and state. Egypt, Babylon, right? Greece, Rome, right? They all believed in that union. The United States is the only unique country in which, at its founding, it decided that it wanted to separate the union of church and state. And that was primarily because of the experience of hundreds of thousands of years in Europe that their ancestors had to endure. Now, let, where am I? It is considered a sovereign state, but with open borders into Rome. That invisible border, boundary line, however, is so clearly understood that it presented a problem for Adolf Hitler, who during World War II wanted to capture or assassinate priests who were sh shielding Jews from the Holocaust, but even he knew he could not cross that line, right? So that's interesting. That's interesting. So the United States in which we live, in which people live, 
in which um, citizens live is a totally different landscape than the landscape that exists or that existed then in the 1960s and prior to that. Now we have the state of U.S. Vatican relations today. Typically, ambassadors who are political appointees and not career diplomats tender their resignations when the president who appointed them leaves office. And the incoming president then nominates new ambassadors. Such a process already is underway behind the scenes with this month's change in administration. And we have the current amb U.S. ambassador to the Holy See is Callista Gingrich, a lifelong Catholic and the third wife of former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. She is the 11th U.S. ambassador to the Holy See and began serving in December 2017. Right? So this is what we, so the, the question is being asked here, what will be the agenda? What is the ultimate agenda of this U.S. Vatican relations? There's a lot of work to be done and a lot of repair to be done. In U.S. Vatican relations, observers have said, Pope Francis, for example, has not been a fan of Trump's first American, or first Ameri America first platform. So he doesn't like that. He doesn't like that sort of platform that the president had. He doesn't believe in America first. He, he believes in internationalism. He believes in globalization. He believes where the, the, the church will eventually reign supreme. Right. So that is what the agenda is to make America into an international state or an international country where globalization is at the core of its philosophies. And because the Roman Catholic papacy does not have an army, a physical you know, army, then it's using the United States military military army. It, 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 it's um it's military to undertake the work that they could not do. Now, remember now that the Vatican, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Papacy, is a is an, an ecclesiastical, it's an ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical behemoth, right? And while the United States has this, you know, military behemoth, it's a military empire, right? So you have one is working with the other. The United States has lost its moral compass and it has surrendered that moral compass, as it were, to the Vatican, to the Pope of Rome. And that is why when the, you know, you have popes after the reestablishment of the U.S. Uh, Vatican relations in, in 1984 under the Ronald Reagan presidency, after that, you see that, you know, fast forward to the 1990s, you see, you saw Bill Clinton inviting the Pope, and he's referring to the, to the Pope as the Holy Father, and they're all bowing down to the Pope, right? American presidents bowing to the Pope and calling the Pope Holy Father. Fast forward to 2007, or was it eight, 2008, I believe, when Ratzinger went to the United States and you had President George Bush, then President George Bush, going to the Air Force Base to receive him, right? And to welcome him to the White House. And we had the unprecedented visit of Pope Francis in 2015, in which he delivered, he addressed a joint session of Congress. That was unprecedented. Talk about the separation of church and state or the union thereof. That was a union. That was a symbolic gesture, a symbolic movement. And, uh, you know, suggesting to the people of the United States that the Vatican means business, right? Because it's, it's addressing a political body, which was the U.S. Congress. And the reception that it received was unprecedented. He was a king. Because that's really they are monarchs. The popes are monarchs. And the United States received this monarch, this religious political monarch, with much joy, excitement, and grandeur. Right? The likes of which the United States has never seen, has never witnessed. And it, it would be interesting to see if the founding fathers, you know, were to have been resurrected at the time, what would they have said when they witnessed a religious political leader? And he's more, I would say, some people say that he's more political than religious, but I think that he uses his religious weapon, his religious sword, as it were, to control the state. Remember now that it's a woman riding the beast and the beast represents the kingdom, a nation, nation state. 
So if the woman is riding the beast, you know who controls whom. That religion controls the politics. Religion controls the government. Something that you've got to understand. And the U.S. is in rapid decline. And we're seeing lots of what Joseph Biden is doing. And remember now that, as we're seeing, that his faith is very important to him. It, play, it informs his politics. His faith informs his politics. But the media have been very silent on Joe Biden's Catholicism. Remember, too, that the Pope of Rome, the popes in general, do not retire. They largely die on the job. I am wondering, and I'm not suggesting that this is what is happening. I am just saying as a thinker, I am wondering if behind the scenes, Joseph Biden would like to die on the job, just like any other pope dies on the job. Right? Remember now that it was unusual when Ratzinger actually retired. He's now deceased, but when he retired in 2013, it was an unusual event because usually popes die in their office and after their death then another pope is elected so i'm wondering if joseph biden as the second american u.s catholic president if he is desirous of dying i'm not saying he is going to die i'm just saying that it's not good what's happening to him and this can lead if he continues in the position it can lead to his rapid decline and perhaps death we don't know we hope that, that it doesn't happen Right? I'm praying that it doesn't happen because this is going to be traumatic for the American political landscape. Right? But what we're seeing is if it's not controlled, it's going to lead to a political crisis. And might I suggest here that after Pope Francis's visit to the United States in 2015, right, in 2015, afterwards, you could, you, you could see that America was a rapid decline in America. I mean, a lot of confusion because afterwards Trump came on the scene and, you know, he had his four, you know, his four years, his first term in office and was, you know, just filled with a lot of chaos. At least the media presented his, you know, presidency as one filled with chaos. And the Joseph Biden's regime is not also together, right? It is chaotic too, but the media has, you know, tried to cover up as much of the chaos that it can, because it's pro Joseph Biden. Don't be fooled by them trying to say that he has to go, and you know, because if they really wanted Joseph Biden to have left, to to have left, why is it that the media were complicit in not having, in not insisting that there be uh, a democratic primary in terms of having other persons who could have contested Joseph Biden's leadership? Because that could have happened. Normally, that, that was what should have happened. It didn't happen this time around. This election cycle, that did not take place. There should have been a primary in which you had debates and you could have other leaders who wanted to have contend, contended um, for the leadership could have done so at that time. Right? But it was not allowed. The Democratic Party didn't allow that. In fact, we had RF Kennedy. That's Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who wanted to contest Joe Biden's position because he was first running as a Democratic on the Democratic ticket, but the Democratic Party would not allow him to do so. And in fact, I read an article early on this year from the political newspaper that anybody who even decided to challenge Joe Biden's leadership that the Democratic Party would have squashed them. And you know how they would have done it? By going and, you know, divulging any secret things and any secret private affairs that they might have had in their lives, right? And they would have certainly knocked them off of their feet. Right? That is how terrible the Democratic Party machine has become. That they were willing to expose and divulge and to and unveil any corrupt activity. And who doesn't have any skeleton in the, in, in, in the closet? I guess we all do. So can you imagine that you have people who decided to have challenged Joseph Biden, and then all of a sudden you hear all of these um, you know, um, allegations of corruptions about them. So many people did not contest him. 
did not contest, did not challenge Joseph Biden's position as leader of the Democratic Party. Now, if the media who are pretending, you remember, you know, just weeks ago, probably days ago, they were the ones saying that jo Joseph Biden was mentally sharp. Right? They are the same ones who were suggesting that Joseph Biden was mentally sharp. And now they're pretending as if he needs to go. He needs to go. The New York Times is writing that perhaps he's not as fit for the job as he should be. But where was New York Times when people were saying that, at least from 2019, that Joseph Biden was, was not the same Joseph Biden that, you know, Americans knew before, that he was suffering from rapid mental decline? Right? Where were they? But now they're pretending as if they want to be objective and they're suggesting that perhaps he needs to go. What is the agenda and why this confusion? Why wasn't there a democratically led primary, right? In which people could have challenged Joe Biden's leadership and you could have had a competent person to shoulder the responsibility of the leader of the Democratic Party. Right? So there's a lot of confusion. We don't know what will happen. All we know is that America is on a rapid decline. Just like you see the cognitive decline, the rapid cognitive decline of the president, America also is suffering from rapid decline. Now, I just wanted to read this paragraph coming from Chalmers Johnson's book, The Sorrows of Empire, Militarism, Secrecy, and the End of the Republic. Now, empires do not last. This is what Chalmers Johnson is saying, and their ends are usually unpleasant. Americans like me, born before World War II, have personal knowledge, in some cases, personal experience of the collapse of at least six empires, those of Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, Great Britain, France, the Netherlands, and the Soviet Union. If one includes all of the 20th century, three more major empires came tumbling down. The Chinese, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman. A combination of imperial overstretch, rigid economic institutions, and an inability to reform weakened all these empires. I'm going to repeat that. These are the three main factors that contributed to the downfall, to the ultimate death of the empires that he has stated. A combination of imperial overstretch, meaning that you are going and you're expanding your empire all throughout the world. And when you expand your empire, you have to dominate people, because that's what empires do, right? They dominate the lives of people and they force people to do whatever they want them to do. Rigid economic, um, where am I now? I missed my site here. Um, institutions, so it is rigid economic institutions and an inability to reform weakened all these empires, leaving them fatally vulnerable in the face of disastrous wars, many of which the empires themselves invited. So the wars that you see that are being waged by the United States empire are wars that have been manufactured, have been engineered, have been invited. They're not real wars. They are wars that are contrived, that are manufactured, that are, that are engineered. Something for you to understand. And the moment you do that, then you understand where the country is heading to and its final fate. This is what Chalmers is saying, which is very, very important that Americans understand. There is no reason to think that an American empire will not go the same way. No reason at all. If you are thinking rationally, you can see it. You can see the military overstretch. You can see that. The imperial overstretch. It is there to see. You can see also the rigid economic institutions where they're telling you that this is what the neoliberal agenda and this is what has to be done. 
and this is what they're going to do. They're not willing to listen to say that perhaps these economic policies are not working. They're just rigid. Yes, they're working. Know that Joseph Biden, at the start of the interview, is talking about all the jobs that he has created. Where are the jobs? And are these jobs taking care of Americans? Can they live by the salaries and the wages that they're receiving from these jobs? But you can't say that because Joseph Biden went on to say in the interview that, you know, he has about 17 economic Nobel laureates who have told him, you know, the phenomenal job that he is doing with the economy, right? These are Nobel laureates. Interesting. And he's saying that they are impressed with his economic performance, what he's doing to uplift the standard of living for all Americans. And that is not true. That is delusional because they have, as Chalmers suggested, this rigid economic institution. And, and I would say rigid economic philosophy that they do not want to tweak and to sort of reform, right? And then he talks about the fact that the, an ability to reform, the fact that he, right now, the system is so much decayed that at this juncture of the history, it is not sure if it can be reformed. In fact, I would, would argue that it can't. Right? I would argue that the United States system at this juncture of the history cannot be reformed. It is going to decay. It is going to die. Now, the death of the United States does not necessarily mean the death of the its empire. Its empire is not going to die that quickly. <laughs> you know, it's really a mighty empire. And, and only God, I think, can destroy that military might, you know, that military apparatus. But the freedoms and the institutions which were designed to safeguard the freedoms for Americans and the quality of living, the standard of living, are going to fall very rapidly. If efforts at globaliz globalization displayed the beginnings of what collapsed for a while, the shift to militarism and imperialism settles the issue. So right now, the United States is spreading its wings through the process of globalization, but it's doing so through militarism and imperialism. It's doing so with the guns, right? The gunboat um, diplomacy. Whatever you want, you if you don't get it, then you just hold up a gun. And the leaders will do what you desire, what you ask of them to do. And this is where we are heading to. And we've got to be careful. And whilst we're talking about the union of church and state, all right, or the separation of church and state, which I believe in, but I think that we have to contextualize it and say, is there anything wrong with teaching religious history in schools? The history of the Bible, the biblical stories, and for Americans to understand how the nation was founded. Is there anything wrong with that? If people are not educated, and many people don't go to church anymore, so they don't understand what the whole Protestant philosophy was about. So how are Americans going to understand what their gender is? They won't if they don't understand that the U.S. founded on Protestant ethos. If those ethos are not maintained, will die right? They'll die because there are other ethos that are contending for that very nation and the soul of that nation, as it were. And, you know, Joseph Biden likes to, talk, likes to talk about the soul of the nation. And we know, for those of us who know the history of Catholicism, we know that Joseph Biden, his primary boss is the Pope of Rome, whether you like it or not. His primary boss is the Church of Rome, the Roman pontiff, what we call Pope Francis. And all Americans in the United States during the era of the 1960s and before, they were correct because they were educated, they were knowledgeable of the role that the Vatican, that the role that the Roman Catholic papacy played in the Dark Ages with the slaughter 
the brutal slaughter of millions of people in the name of religion, in the name of an apostate religion, in the name of a spurious religion. Let's wake up. Let's understand. And I don't know, for the likes of me, why Joseph Biden is holding on to office, why he's defiant. I'm not sure who is actually inducing, who is strengthening his resolve to stand there. But somehow I think there is some spiritual leader who is behind him, who is actually pushing him along. And that spiritual leader has a lot of voice, has a lot of power, has a lot of sway. And you've got to understand it. There's no way a man at 81 years old could be holding on to power and fighting against that powerful military apparatus without that apparatus silencing him, right? There's no way he could do that as much as you think he's the president of the United States. But you must understand that the president of the United States does not run the show. Right? He, yes, he represents a symbol of power, but there are other powerful forces above him that you and I can't see, and we can't put our hands on. So let me just say that we've got to read more, and we've got to just analyze the news and what's going on. And we must look at the hypocrisy and call it the hypocrisy of the media when they be, pretend as if they are analyzing and they are interpreting the news in an objective manner, because they're not. Because if they were doing it, as I'm suggesting, they would have known that Joseph Biden should have left and the media should have been calling out, should have been screaming that this man has to go, but they didn't. And now that things are you know, falling apart, and the center cannot hold, then they're beginning to pretend as if they are reporting, you know, from a dispassionate or objective perspective, but they're not. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you will like and you'll share and you'll subscribe. And I look forward to joining you to see you in another video when I upload another video. See you then. All the best to you. Bye.